Thank you. Here from GM, and she is part of our Dick Warwick uh, Market Research Professorship Series. So what we're trying to do is basically get you all excited about market research and um, give you a glimpse into this very important world of data and analytics and how it's really driving what we do in advertising and public relations and marketing. And so thank you so much for coming tonight. We really think that she's a dynamite speaker. And I want to briefly also thank um, Professor Dane Kiambi, who was a Plan Fellow this past summer at GM. Well, he spent, you spent, what, two weeks there, Dane? Yes. Yeah, and um, so it's, it's a way for our instructors to work in industry for a little while and to see what's happening so that we can bring this back into the classroom. So, um, what we're going to do is hear from Whitney, and I'll tell you a little bit about her background for about an hour or so, and then we want to open it up for questions. So, um, please take the opportunity to ask her whatever it is that you're interested in. So, let me tell you a little bit about her background. Um, Whitney Drake, she manages the Story Bureau and Analytics team within GM Communications. And so her team uses research and measurement to tell GM stories in outlets and media that reach specific target audiences with the ultimate goal of driving brand reputation and sales for General Motors. She first worked with GM when she implemented Chevrolet's social media strategy, then managed the global social integration of all of GM's US brands. She joined the Global Social Media Center of Expertise, which sets strategy, measurement, and <coughs> education around social best practices. Um, that was in 2013. She was responsible for managing global social customer care and defining a social care customer satisfaction number, as well as determining a way to measure how this practice impacted the bottom line. Most recently, she worked on GM's operational excellence team using Six Sigma practices to solve problems across the company. She brings more than 20 years of experience consulting for consumer goods and automotive clients. She has created unique activations for the Super Bowl, doesn't get any bigger than that, right? American Idol, South by Southwest, Children's Place, and T-Mobile. She has a master's degree in integrated marketing communications from West Virginia University and earned her Bachelor of Arts degree in communications from Michigan State University. She currently is an adjunct instructor at West Virginia University and also at Wayne State University. So help me welcome Whitney and we'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much and thanks to the staff and Dane for having me and thanks to you guys for coming out. I know you're in the middle of getting ready for presentations and coming off the Thanksgiving holiday so I really appreciate the fact that you came out. Um, just to touch a little bit on the Story Bureau, we use creative elements like graphics, images, and videos to help tell our brand stories both at a corporate and a nameplate level. And the job of my team is to help use analytics, measurement, and research to help drive those stories and then ultimately develop them. We want to make sure that we're measuring, we're implementing measurement at the beginning and revisiting it at the end to change the way that we look at things moving forward. We talked a little bit about me. Uh, a couple of things that we didn't talk about is that I love to travel and was lucky enough in my job to get to go to China, Singapore, Brazil, South America, Mexico, uh, and a few other countries. So the opportunity to mix travel along with work I highly commend, so if you get that kind of job, go for it. I'm also the mom to twins. They're five-year-olds. Um, they are very busy, and they keep me on my toes. And usually, I don't get a lot of sleep, so if you want to find me on a social network, please do so. OK, so one of the jobs about from a PR research perspective is to make sure that we are using research to solve problems and drive the messaging and strategies that we're trying to tell. So everyone has a little bit of a different repu or different <clears throat> definition of how you look at research. So these are just a couple of examples of PRSA and PR Week. So in many cases, it's proprietary. So for example, we're doing some research that I can't share with you guys. I'm happy to talk in larger context, but we consider it proprietary to our business. And so you will run into that if you're talking to companies. Don't be offended. It's not personal. It's mainly because they're trying to protect the research and what they're trying to use it for. 
Um, there's third party research, which I'm going to get into all of the different types of research. But I like our definition, which is the CAT, and we use research to keep us out of trouble. And I'm going to talk a little bit specifically about how companies might have used research to help them when they were messaging and making announcements later. So my first example is Amazon. So how many people are familiar with Amazon's home delivery announcement from October? Okay. So I'll give a little background for those that aren't, because most of you aren't. They basically announced that they would leverage smart lock and use video footage to allow delivery people to put packages inside of your home. How many people think this is a great idea? How many people think this is a bad idea? Okay. <laughs> so Sarah, <laughs> I'm laughing because this is a great example of when research would have helped them. So you represent the majority of the sentiment that we saw after their announcement. So how's it going to affect my insurance prices? Um, why would we let people into our home when we spend a ton of time trying to keep them out? An example of Silicon Valley being completely out of touch. When you go into the statistics, which some people expected the younger demographics to be in favor of it, um, more than half were uncomfortable. And as the older you got, the less comfortable people got statistically. Um, so bottom line is not many people were comfortable with doing this. <clears throat> I'm going to come back to this in a little bit. but. One of the things that we want to look at is what is the problem you're trying to solve when you do the research? So when you talk to researchers, you want to keep these things in mind. So what is the objective? So if we look at Amazon, their objective would be to understand home delivery, right? Um, what questions are you trying to answer? At the end of the project, how will you know what success looks like? Oftentimes, my team will spend several calls trying to define what success looks like. Obviously, if we're doing a campaign, you have to have an end goal in mind. It could be to improve brand reputation. It could be to improve sales. It could be to change an image or drive customer awareness. It could be, um, I'm going to talk a little bit later about vaccines. It could be to drive, to drive vaccination rates up. It could be any of those things, but at the end of the day, when you're trying to look at research or measurement, you need to know what your end game is at the beginning, or at least have some kind of idea of where you're headed. Do we already have any information available for the program or the problem? So is there any research that validates what we're trying to look at or negates it? And then do we need to do more research, or are we just trying to fill a gap? Because research can be expensive. And so you want to make sure you're not just conducting it without looking at what else is available. Will this be something that we revisit later? Is it one and done? Um, is it just a quick look? Or are we going to look at it at the beginning and the end? Keeping in mind that sometimes if you're doing a survey and you want to use the information publicly, you have to um, disclose that at the beginning of your research project. And then what is the definition of the audience in question? So who are we trying to look at? Um, what's the ideal candidate? So are you trying to look at someone who is 18 to 24 currently in the market for a job? Or is it someone 18 to 24 who already has a job or is in school? So be as specific as possible. And if you don't know, you can spend time with the team to define it and, and work together on that. And then once you have it, what are you going to use it for? So I love GM, but we have a tendency to get a lot of data. And sometimes we don't all, always take action on that data. So make sure that if you're doing research, you're going to have an action from that data. That's not to say there will be times where you do research and the data doesn't deliver on what you expected, perhaps. That's not the same as not having a plan to use the data. So how can we use? PR research. We want to understand an issue. We want to identify stakeholders and audiences. We want to formulate objectives. We want to formulate key messages. And then we want to follow up through evaluation, adjustment, and next steps. Remember, a lot of times when you're using measurement and research in PR, it's not necessarily 
a moment in time. Yes, those happen, but generally speaking, you should take the research to drive different decisions in the future or adjust in a campaign as you're going. So all of the research should set an objective, develop a strategy based on those objectives, and implement steps based on the strategy. So again, make sure you clearly outline what you're trying to do in the process. I'm going to talk a little bit of types of research. So there's formal research and informal research. And I'm going to go into a little bit more detail in a minute. There's primary research, which is research you conduct, and secondary research. There's qualitative and quantitative research. And then within GM, we use the research to understand our target audience or gain insights on a product or service, build a story or create content, or understand the industry competitive intelligence. So how is GM's brand uh, compared to some of our competitors or even outside of the auto industry in the tech space? How do we perform or what do people think of us? Okay, so now I'm going to go a little bit deeper on the qualitative research. Um, the nominal groups can be, and these are all just rough numbers, there's no steadfast, you can only have 10 to 12 people, but um, it's typically, they're typically somewhat knowledgeable about the topic, so you're not just picking someone off the street, you've done a little bit of pre-research um, to see if they understand it, and you're trying to gain additional research and it can have a brainstorming element to it. The in-depth interviews, which would be open-ended and are usually conducted in person, although over the last probably two years we're seeing more digital research being conducted, there is something to be said for in-person research, just like in-person presentations and conversations, body language, tone of voice, things that you can't necessarily get um, through digital research even when you're using Skype or other methods to conduct the research. Focus groups are moderated group discussions, usually six to 12 participants. And on this one, we do try to tend to keep it around 12 because the larger the group, the harder it is to conduct the research and keep it in a productive manner. Field observations, so just observing um, the public in their natural setting. So what are they doing or what are they looking at? And then finally, the Q methodology, which is a quantitative means to study a uh, point of view on their beliefs. So each respondent force ranks their beliefs so that you can understand it. So this is an example of a focus group that we used as an ad. Hi. Hello. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Good enough to see. Thanks for coming today. Thanks for having us. We're a marketing research company, so I need to collect your phone so you can take pictures, can Instagram, you can tweet about it. Can I have like a safety jacket on it this time? Yeah. 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 Ye
So how did you guys feel when he threw the phones in the chipper? Anyone? I think the point was this focus group and what I was speaking to earlier is being in person, you actually get to see people's reactions. And it was very, very visceral. Like, oh my god, the one woman who got up, the side eye. So it's just important. And usually when we do focus groups, there's someone observing in another room so that they can take in what's happening. The moderator isn't the one having to take notes. So it's important when you're showing different types of, you could be showing some kind of campaign and you conduct it in a focus group. And you want to take in everyone's perspective. And a lot of times we'll videotape it as well so that we can see it and go back. Because sometimes people will answer you and sometimes they won't, but their facial expressions will tell a lot as well. Okay, so quantitative research, so systematically analyzing the content to see if key messages are being communicated to the audience um, and analyzing documents and news articles. So this is one that we use a lot at GM. So every time we launch a product or a vehicle or a technology, we have key messages that we want to see in the coverage. So the team provides us the key messages that are going to be covered at an event, and my team goes through the articles or the coverage whether it's in the social space, digital, or um, broadcast, and looks to see what is our key message penetration. And then from there, we can refine our messages either to fix something if something's been missed or to continue along that same key message. Surveys um, are used to find a probability in a sample. So if you're looking at specific questions and you want to know what someone's take on it, survey can have um, a scale, it can be open-ended, it can be however you need to do it. If you've never written a survey, I suggest working with someone who has written a survey because it's not as simple. Don't get me wrong, I love SurveyMonkey, but you really do need to know how to organize the survey from start to finish, and you don't want a survey that's 100 questions long because people will not finish it. Um, and sometimes you want to ask a question in multiple ways to see if they are consistent. So spend some time before you do a survey understanding a survey because it's not super simple. I would love it to be super simple, but sometimes it's not. And then controlled experiments. Um, you can check your hypothesis under specific conditions. For example, our hypothesis could have been that they were all going to flip out that they lost their phone, and we tested that. Financial analysis, so you can look at a return on investment and demonstrate consumer trends. So obviously, is it impacting the bottom line? And if we change something, will it change the results? So here's an example of a survey that we've done. So how often do you and your family take or go on road trips, long distance journeys by vehicle? And then the question, the, the choices are below. And then the second question is, how much did you do it growing up? So we were trying to understand, is it something that's passed on from family members? Does it change? And then how frequently are people going on road trips? OK. So earlier I talked about Amazon home delivery, and I want to come back to it. We're not going to do a group. I was going to divide you up and do a little bit of an exercise, but we're just going to do it as a group. So please participate. <laughs> Um, so if you worked on their research team, what kind of study would you have conducted to drive your communication plan? So I have got five questions. What was your objective of the research? I'm going to read them all out, and then I'll come back. Do we already have information available on the program? Will this be a question that we need to revisit later? What is the definition for the audience in question? And what do we plan to do with the information? And then do you think it would be formal, informal? Do you think it would be primary or secondary? And do you think it would be quantitative or qualitative? So what do you think the objective of the research for Amazon Home Delivery would have been if they had done it? I'm going to call on you, so you might want to volunteer. <laughs> Go ahead. 
Mm -hmm. Right. That's great. Anyone else? Hoodie in the blue sweatshirt. Okay. Give me one more. Go ahead. Okay. Does anyone think a question about geography would matter? What kind of question might that be? New York. <laughs> Okay, so these are all great questions. So do you think home delivery is a good idea would be probably the most basic question. Um, geographically, does it matter? So a lot of people in New York or LA who don't live in a house and don't have a porch might find, or even Chicago, and don't have a doorman might find this to be useful. Um, and then is it a safety thing? Does the video part even matter? Because I don't think it did. I think Amazon thought that having video would be make it OK. And based on the results of the poll, it didn't really make that big of a difference. So those would be all great questions to ask. And you could use formal. You could use informal. So for example, the informal research we did just to do this was I looked at people's social um, feeds and there was a lot of conversation around whether or not this was a good idea and most people generally thought it wasn't so that was somewhat informal but it was enough um, qualitative data to have form an opinion primary and secondary research could have been conducted as well they could have gone out with a survey they could have conducted a focus group um, and they could have done it in different markets to have a different approach so i think this is a great example where I love Amazon, but they really fell short in, I think, what they expected the results to be for this, and research could have helped them. Oops, wrong keyboard. OK, so I'm going to talk a little bit about other ways that people have used research. I have a political example in here, but it's not meant to be political. It's just an example. <laughs> I feel like I have to preface that. Um, and then I'm going to um, show another video, and then we'll keep going. Do you guys have any questions at this point? OK, cool. So one of the things that came up um, when you were looking at the presidential election is if they were targeting specific uh, individuals trying to garner additional votes, what do those people read, use, watch. And social gives us an uncanny ability to drill down into a lot of personal information, which generally we all know it gives us, but sometimes I think we forget. So in this case, the column on the left are things that people who would vote for or support Hillary like, and the things on the right were things that people who would vote for or support Donald Trump would like. So if you were the president-elect and you were trying to target on social media, you might specifically run ads against people who have liked these brands or products. OK, um, how many people are familiar with the Milk Mustache campaign? OK. So the Milk Mustache campaign was developed by the milk processors. It's called the Milk Pep. And it was very successful. They used a lot of different celebrities with milk mustaches. And it actually drove an increase in milk sales. Following that campaign, they needed another way to keep milk sales up, because obviously other drinks, particularly energy drinks, have taken the forefront to milk. So they did research, and they found out that chocolate milk was as effective or more effective than an energy drink for people who did strenuous exercise. They then leveraged Kelly O'Hara, who was an um, Olympic soccer star, to represent and be the face of chocolate milk. And in the end, they were able to drive up demand and consumptions after three years of decline. So I think the bottom line is, is that sometimes when you're challenged with 
a problem like milk versus an energy drink, research can help you find a different way to tell the story. And then in this case, they had the opportunity to leverage a star to be the face of that campaign. You don't always have that kind of money to get a star, but you still have a lot of data to drive improved milk sales. Okay, how many people like pizza? How many people know about Domino's? Okay, I'm gonna play a video. Um, the bottom line is that Domino's had a very poor reputation and it was impacting their bottom line and they had to take a hard look at what was happening. You know, you can't lead a, a, a company like this unless you love food. I love food. I love pizza. It was about 50 years ago that they started the first store just about five months. The two brothers had a great idea, and they also said they wanted to get it delivered within 30 minutes, and that's uh, something no one said could be done. In fact, the first pizza delivery vehicle for our company is that vehicle right there. Around the 80s, we were exploding. We were the fastest growing company in the history of franchise business. Nothing had ever grown like that. Not at all. 9,000 restaurants around the world. We love what we do at Domino's. Pizza, where's my love? How are you? Bread, sauce, cheese, fresh ingredients. Doesn't feel like there's much love to Domino's pizza. <laughs> Domino's pizza crust to me is like cardboard. Is that smart? Excuse for pizza I've ever had. The sauce tastes like ketchup? Totally void of flavor. You know what, when you first hear it, it's, it's, it's shocking. The cardboard complaint is the most common one. This we hear over and over and over. I mean, that hits you right in the heart. This is what we've done, this is what I've done, you know, for 25 years now. You can either use negative comments to get you down, or you can use them to excite you and energize your process of making a better pizza. We did the latter. Most companies uh, hide the criticism that they're they're getting, and we actually faced it head on. Some people didn't give us credit for the, the taste of our product. That's what we're fixing. Mm -hmm. We listen to our consumers, and they want us to be better, and we want them to be happier. We want people to love our pizza. This is what's driving us. This is what's lit the fire under us. This is what's making us want to get better. It's been crazy down here. We had our best chef. Working hard to find the best combination, looking at 10 cross types, 15 sauces, dozens of cheeses. You can't just add a little salt or add a little something to the recipe. I mean, we basically had to start over with a new recipe. And they were working day and night and weekends to get it done. You know, this is Roxanne. She's one of the lead chefs for pizzas, and she's constantly trying new stuff. And she's saying, try this and try that. You know, the day she put this in front of me, I said, dang. This is the real deal. We changed everything. The crust, the sauce, the cheese. Now it tastes better. We started working on the cheese. We've got shredded cheese. Cheese. It's cheese. It's tastier. When you smell it, it's got an aroma to it. I mean, this is what cheese should be. We started working on the sauce. New sauce is bright. It's spicy. It's robust. We've got garlic in here. We've got oregano. We've got basil. We've got... Um, and a little bit of red pepper just, just to take them on your tongue. It's a bold flavor. When you bite into that, that's what pizza sauce should taste like. We started working on the crust. A nice, rich, buttery crust with some garlic and some herbs in there. Gives it a, a, a nice finish for you. Great taste from the first bite to the last bite on every single slice. Now we got great food we burn in the swagger, right? We're going to do an end zone dance on this one. I can't wait to have people try it. It's not even about being right. It's about us having great food. No, it's about us being right. <laughs> and you know, I can't wait for Adrian to try our new pizza. So I think she's going to be surprised. We're going to bring her the new pizza. See how she likes it. She has no idea what's coming. Adrian? Yeah.
crap. Um, so I wanted to just touch on a couple of things. They used taste tests, they used website surveys, they used focus groups, and they used social media data to drive all of this um, research and decisions. And the other part that I love from the video is everybody in the company had a stake in making the change. So I think that's really important. If you're asked to do a research project at a company, one of the first questions you might want to ask is who is going to receive the research and who is on board to conduct the research project. Because if you're doing it for one small pocket of an organization and it's not going to be bought in across the organization, it will be very hard to ch affect change. And I think that's part of why I love the Domino's example, because it was every level. The people making the pizza, the marketing department, the PR department, um, the franchisees, etc. So just think a little bit about that as you move forward. Okay, so a little earlier I touched on a survey about road trips. So we wanted to look at road trips from the perspective of what stresses parents out, what is the right length of a road trip, and having just returned from a 10 plus one way road trip this past weekend with two five year olds, 10 plus hours is not the ideal length of a road trip. <laughs> just say no. Um, why do Americans love road trips? And then how do we use in-car technology on a road trip? And then from that, we basically conducted research with 1,000 parents who had children under 18 to learn about it. It was interesting insights like the right length, um, how, like I mentioned, technology, and then even when you travel for the holidays, what's the right time to go, what about traffic, etc. So we used that to um, produce tips and tricks for road trips, and then we pitched it before the busy holiday travel season. And we ended up using it for 104 local TV hits, which reached an estimated um, group of 1.1 million folks. And then we had 21 digital stories with a reach of about 231,000. So again, from the beginning, what was the story that we were trying to tell? How would we use it? And then measuring it at the end. In this case, we were really happy with the results because it was coverage on a product that had existed, so it wasn't anything new. So there wasn't a lot of refinement, but we do know that we can go back to these um, as evergreen content if we want to for the next upcoming holiday travel. So the next one we had was, how do you promote products in a timely fashion? So. Um, in August of 17, there were over 360,000 kids in the US that were going to turn 16. And in August, we is also back to school. So Chevy offered a free trial of Family Link, which allows uh, parents to monitor their children's driving habits, so where they're going, how fast they're going, how long they're driving. And then we. Um, use that research to tell stories on Good Morning America, Fox, Daily News, CNET, um, Cool Mom Tech, and our OnStar Family Link subscription spiked 400% after the demonstrations. So we looked at research from the CDC, and then we also looked at our own research on Family Link, what do parents want, and that's how we came up with this messaging. So again, not just our own research, but looking at the birth dates and when people will turn 16, the most popular month, and then back to school, which are two, I think, crazy times for parents, having a kid turn 16 and then them driving to school, a little bit stressful. I'm not there yet, but I'll let you know. Another one was, what, what do you do when we don't have any news? So in August of this year, we didn't have a lot of um, announcements around Maven. But we knew that the end of the summer is a prime road trip opportunity. And we knew that 80% of our Maven um, users were millennials. So we worked with a research organization to survey 2,000 um, US-based millennials, age 18 to 35, and look at their social calendars, spending habits, and summer adventures. And then we produced some interesting summer trends. And we did them in infographics um, as a change of presentation. And then we pitched them. 
And we got coverage in Yahoo News, MSN, New York Post, um, Houston Chronicle, and a few others. So again, how you present the content matters, not just the content itself, because they actually reproduce the graphics. So that's part of my team's responsibility, is making these interesting graphics. Could be video, could be an infographic, could be an image. All right, this one's a little complicated, but Basically, um, when we were launching 4G LTE, which is the technology behind having internet in your vehicle, which you saw in the focus group, we weren't the first to market. And in the auto industry, being the first to market is always a big deal. So we wanted to figure out how could we compete when you're not the first to market. So the team laid out this grid with our closest competitor, and to be honest, there was several competitors, but I just truncated it to make it look nice. And we realized that, <coughs> excuse me, we would have 33 models. It would be free for five years. We had a touch screen. It had the full suite of safety features. You got diagnostics, you could do remote start, and you could get service and destination downloads, <coughs> which our competitors didn't have. So we packaged that messaging up and we pitched it to business and technology outlets. And the most common message was that we had the broadest deployment of 4G LTE in the industry and it showed our commitment to technology. So it was our way to make news when we weren't the first, but we had a better story. But we had to sit down and commit the research to t figure out what that story was. Okay. <clears throat> Christmas creep. Who knows what I'm talking about? Anyone? Okay. Um, Christmas creep is basically the notion that you see Christmas decorations in stores around Halloween. Okay, so now that you know, how many of you have seen Christmas creep? Okay. <laughs> we had a very um, passionate debate in our office about Christmas creep, and one of our um, team members put up all of her holiday decorations directly after Halloween. To which the rest of us were like, no, you have to celebrate Thanksgiving. Anyways, so <clears throat> this is some of the feedback which cracks me up, but um, I'm not gonna go to school because I have to buy Christmas decorations. Um, Target has them, can I start playing Christmas music? There are two types of people when the Christmas decorations appear, <laughs> and then Christmas in September. So Nordstrom's actually has a policy on this that they, um, that they don't put up their decorations until after Thanksgiving, and they actually have staff that volunteer to work that shift to get ready for the day after Thanksgiving, which I thought was really interesting. And then the other part of the story is being open for Black Friday, which is another part of kind of Christmas creep in its own way. Um, but they're closed on Thanksgiving, and then they still have people who want to come in to work to get ready for the Friday after. So I think it speaks a lot to how Nordstrom treats their people. <clears throat> REI did something different. They wanted to start a movement, so they created the hashtag opt outside. So instead of shopping, they want you to spend the time or the day outside. And you can see some appreciation from potential or current customers about how you should spend your time. I might need to go to water number two. So a lot of people have asked, is Christmas creep either decorating early or opening on Thanksgiving um, to sell uh, more to customers worth it? 
The data is pretty interesting. I think one of the things that I didn't expect out of the data is that there's traditional shoppers and early shoppers. And if you're an early shopper, it doesn't matter if you're open on Thanksgiving or not. You've already started your shopping and you have, may have a few more things that you're going to buy on Black Friday. But it's not, it's not hugely detrimental. But the cons are that most people believe that the stores should be closed on Thanksgiving and people should be allowed to spend time with their family. And I think this was the first Thanksgiving that I saw less um, momentum around being open on Thanksgiving Day and more focused back on Black Friday and then also a continued movement to Cyber Monday. So I expect, based on this research and what, what companies are saying, that we'll probably see even more shift as we move forward. Okay. So this was going to be my second exercise. So Cyber Monday has become more popular. 45% said they plan to begin shopping November 1st, and 17% say they missed Thanksgiving for Black Friday deals. If you were a retailer, what kind of research might you conduct to figure out your customers' shopping habits? What questions might you ask? Anyone? How often do you go shopping? To okay. your store. To your store? Okay. Um, what else? Anyone else? How much time do they spend? In the store? Good. Go ahead. How much they spend shopping in store versus online for your mm -hmm. business? Good one. Anything specific to holiday shopping? Okay, I'll give you a break. It's Tuesday and it's late. <laughs> um, I think they're all valid. I think one of the things you have to focus in on or we're trying to focus in on is how much are you shopping online versus how much you're shopping in person and why. So traditionally a lot of people shop, and I don't have research to back this up, but they shop in person because the deals are so good and there's a limited number of items. So is there a way to ask research questions around that so that you can offer those deals? And is it possible to shift away from, say, having to be open on the Thursday of Thanksgiving with your team versus offering some of those same deals online and perhaps turning Thursday into Cyber Thursday instead of Monday to get a jump on it? So those are the types of questions and research that you can conduct to see what your consumers want. I think. Nordstrom's didn't conduct a ton of research with their consumers to understand that they didn't want them to be open and that they don't want them to decorate, but they knew their consumers well enough to make those decisions. So sometimes it's understanding your consumer from the get-go, sometimes it's asking your consumer what they want. Any other thoughts on that one? Okay. So the next part is how do you communicate your results? So um, I talked a little bit about the MMR vaccine. So for my graduate capstone project, I did um, a mark integrated marketing campaign on the MMR vaccine and trying to improve MMR um, vaccination rates. So one of the things that I found in my research and one of the things that my professor challenged me to understand was that Michigan Oregon and California have some of the lowest vaccination rates in the country. And on the surface, Michigan, Oregon, and California don't seem to have a lot in common. So I use secondary research to understand that Michigan, Oregon, and California happen to be in the top 10 states for organic food sales, and they represent 79% of organic food sales in the United States. So from there, I was able to go on and do additional research that said that a lot of the folks opting out of vaccinations in Michigan also tend to be health conscious and buying organic foods. So I was able to make a correlation based on existing research between organic food purchases and the 
opting out of vaccines in those particular states. I would have loved to do more research to validate this, but it was for my paper, and so I didn't have a budget to go out and do additional research. And I actually found this after I had done some in-focus, um, in-person focus groups. So something to be said for the timing of your research and your focus groups as well. So then the next thing that we had to do for our paper, and I don't know how many of you, how many of you have written a creative brief? Okay, good. So um, I had to write a creative brief. So how did I leverage the research that I conducted into um, the creative brief? So sentiment around the MMR vaccine is very low. It was very low in the research that you do online, and it was very low in the in-person research that I conducted. Um, I found that when I was talking to moms, first-time moms tended to be um, more concerned and worried. And then I used verbatims for what did they currently think, and people in my focus groups said that the government was lying to them. So I used all of that research to help drive the creative brief, and I thought this was an interesting way. I had never really used research to drive a creative brief until I was asked to do it in a class. Um, we've done creative briefs. Typically when we were doing a creative brief, we were doing it based on a, a very important need at a moment in time, which didn't ask us to look at research. But I think as I move forward, it will be part of my um, toolkit now to try to leverage what research exists as we're writing our creative briefs. And then when I wrote the communication plan and set the objectives, it was based on that same um, research. So we wanted to make sure that we were reaching out in Michigan specifically. We wanted to target the first and second trimesters. And I used research, CDC research again, to look at the um, births, most when most birth, births in the US occur. And then, um, we wanted to reach out to specific areas in Michigan because they had higher um, or lower vaccination rates. And then how were we gonna, what were we gonna leverage to target them, so broadcast as well as digital. So just using the research to be more targeted in the audience, especially when you have a limited budget, really helps uh, you reach the specific folks that you can make the most difference with. So how do you measure success? I would say that measuring success is highly debated and throughout my 20 year career, it's not changed. Um, everyone has an opinion, everyone's opinion tends to vary. So the only advice that I would say is be consistent and make sure that you start with the end in mind in your measurement. So you need to be statistically significant. So Dana and I were talking earlier, we're doing some research right now and a couple of people have asked us to change some of it and we've committed to doing it for three months so that we at least have three months of data to refer back to. So just try to keep those things in mind and be open to the fact that it is highly debated and probably always will be and that's probably good for all of us. Measuring, um, Communication studies are important, and personality traits, behaviors, attitudes, and beliefs can, measure, can fa factor into that. And then my team is very committed to the Barcelona Declaration of Measurement Principles, and I must admit that until I worked on this presentation, I was not familiar with them, but they recently refined them. Um, the major thing that changed from the previous version was um, that they you have to consistently use both quantitative and qualitative and that you're looking at communication measurement specifically. So I think this is a way of differentiating our measurement from marketing or advertising measurement. So in closing, ask tough questions, follow through with the research, Hold yourself and your team accountable and try to think with the end in mind. Who has questions? Go ahead. Um, okay, so you're talking about you know, kind of some of the ways you can conduct research both like in the primary secondary and 
Um, but I didn't see, I might have missed it, but I didn't see anything about like data analysis as far as like, you know how much data you're just collecting like users across like um, the internet at this point, right? Yeah. I'm wondering how much that's growing. Do you, do you count that in your market research or is that like a data analysis job which is outside of the world of market research? Or how do those two tie together? You know? So I focus this presentation on research. I consider that analytics. Um, my team also does analytics and we, we um, look at what are the, like I mentioned, the key messages, what are we trying to say, what audience are we trying to reach, and then what's the earned reach in those audiences. Right now we're in the process of trying to marry research and reputation with analytics. In some cases we've been very successful. We have a lot of brands at GM and so each brand varies, but that's one of the reasons that I'm in this job and I've just, it's September, the middle of September. So yes, it's both are very important. And to answer the second part of your question about how much data is available, there's tons of data. Like, I think one of the things that was so exciting for me to work in the social space in previous jobs was how much data and how quickly you can use it and how targeted you can be. I think the question still remains, what's the return on investment for using that data? In, some, in consumer goods, there's a lot of return on investment in, in brands that are using strictly social for advertising, there's huge, but I think it varies by industry and market and age group. Other questions? Go ahead. Yeah, so you guys have a lot of um, access through the school's library system, and I don't know what, I'm sure you guys have a name for it, where you can find research that's been conducted already. There's a lot of research done by universities and professors, so you can, yeah, you can leverage that data. You can use um, SurveyMonkey to conduct research, and, and for example, when I had to do research for my paper, I gave away a gift card to Starbucks, so it was a way to get people engaged in doing the survey. Um, so I would just say the one thing that I've tried to teach my students when you're trying to find data points, it's never the first click. You have to dig and you might have to change your re what you're searching on to try to get to the actual data and then try to look at a couple of different sources just to make sure that you're not looking at it with a bias. But there is a lot of, a lot of free tools and research out there. Other questions? <laughs> Go ahead. Um, all of the examples that you showed used a variety of data, different approaches, different research designs. Can you talk a little bit about um, your confidence as a researcher that you have enough to make a decision that translates into an effective creative brief? So, it's a really interesting question. So we. Um, Analysis by paralysis, so sometimes if you have too much data, you never do anything. So if you talk to um, Jackie on my team is very scientific. She wants every data point and every piece of data. I want as much as we can get in the time frame that we can have it. I personally don't think there's a hard and fast rule. Um, especially when we're writing a creative brief because you're going to do, fo like in our industry, we do focus groups, we test it, we do a lot of additional um, validation. I think in other areas, like when you're looking at something in medical, then the data needs to be more precise. So I think my answer would vary based on what you're doing. Go ahead. So I think it, yeah, so I think, let, let's just say they didn't do research, which in my heart of hearts, I don't believe they did research. So now they've seen, let's just say they have social monitoring and they saw all of the conversations, which they should, if they don't, that's a mistake, but they, they've seen it now. I think if, I think the iteration now would be to go back to the drawing board and say, what questions should have we have we asked, and then what refinements might we want to make? Like for example, 
I don't think a national launch is a great idea. I think a market by market launch would be awesome for them. So maybe they conduct research in New York and start in a certain subdivision to buy acceptance. And then they leverage those people to talk about as influencers to talk about how much they love it versus just we're opening this up to everyone because it's kind of tarnished it already, in my opinion, because people are a bit defensive about it instead of if they got a groundswell of early adopters. There are people who want it. But I mean, it's it's. I don't think it's inevitable that it won't. I think it's going to come. It's just how do you get people to accept it? Other questions? All right. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. If you guys want to ask, if you want to ask me questions one on one, I'm going to stay for a little bit. Right. So we have a little bit of time, and then also, um, and I don't know if you know this, but um, can you tell us anything? Do you have an internship program in your department? <laughs> we do. The communications department has internships. Um, if you, I don't think we post them. So I will work with Dane to figure out how we communicate them moving forward. And personally speaking, we don't have enough analytic, research-minded people. So if you have an interest in it and have the ability to take classes and learn more, um, and this is across all of GM. I'm on a, um, an analytics leadership council, and we are spending a lot of time talking about it. So I encourage you to, to take the time to understand research, data, and analytics. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>